Hello, my name is Sue Gardner and welcome to the Pool Focus series of artist interviews for Art Collector magazine. I'm based in Auckland, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and it's my pleasure to welcome to this interview Helen Calder. Um, and Helen, welcome. Where are you joining us from today? Thanks, Sue. I'm joining you from Christchurch. I'm in my studio having a nice break. Oh, you're having a good break. Well, I know yeah. that you've had a lot of um, work on the go there in the studio and you, you, know, you have a very interesting process, which is very connected to an examination of painting um, and all of its uh, histories and perhaps its futures as well, Helen. But um, the, what we'd like to do and we're going to talk about is a work that you've selected today that's called Lime Fold. And Lime Fold is um, a very curious work. It's uh, a fairly small work, 23 by 90 by 12 centimetres, dated 2020, but in fact made over a couple of years. And if I put the image up, I think our audience members will see what I mean when I, when I say about it being a curious image. So here we are, Lime Fold. And Helen, um, I think what's curious about it is initially as viewers, and especially particularly through a screen, we're not, we're not right in front of the work where we can assess the, um, the kind of tactile nature of the object we're looking at. But can you tell us, what are we looking at? Well, essentially, uh, it's, a, it's a painting, first of all, and we'll probably talk more about that. Um, and it is actually a sheet of paint um, draped over a wire armature. And uh, the sheet of paint is very soft and pliable. Um, it's a, a folded piece. And so you'll see a dark band at the bottom of the work, which is the uh, inside of the work. Um, it's uh, made up of a number of layers of paint, that dark layer being the very last one that was applied. And mm -hmm. what you see on the surface is probably two or three layers, um, each built up with transparent uh, pigments and then a little bit more opaque as it goes through. So probably in total, the average 10 layers of paint. Um, and the paint's applied in a, in a very um, regular way. So that's in this particular case, small dashes of brush marks left to right and horizontal rows. And the reason for that is to get an overall consistency to the um, sheet of paint. Um, it, it actually started as a much larger piece. And, and so you made mention of the fact that it took um, a little longer than um, 2020 to make. So I, it starts, most of these works and, and line folds no exception, start as a much larger poured sheet of paint. And I say poured because I work on a surface, a horizontal surface, a large table with a plastic covering. And I work back to front. So I start with the very transparent layers, building those up. And then finally, a much more dense and usually a dark, but not always, uh, layer of paint. That takes some time to cure. Um, the uh, process is that I leave it on uh, the horizontal for at least four or five days before I can peel it off. And then it, it stays flat for some time. Eventually it's hung and I have a, um, almost a library of pieces that I can then go to and use. Uh, and in this particular case, I wanted to emphasize the pliability of the softness of this paint surface. I mean, one way to discover it is to touch it, but obviously we can't in photograph and in a gallery, you probably get told off. Mm -hmm. um, but by introducing another element to the work, um, I get the, we get the feeling of it not being totally rigid. Um, so when I was making this work, it was uh, cut and folded in one direction, uh, left for some time, and then opened out, refolded back over the armature. So what we see is that vertical crease down the work, uh, which I think it, it does um, give that feeling. Mm. Um, 
Well, Helen, a quick question about the pliability and the softness of the surface. Um, you know, we think about surfaces of paintings that maybe have been around for some time, and we particularly think about what the way surfaces of paints crack over time. Do you do you have a particular technique which, in a way, enables this kind of pliability, this softness to happen for you to lift it from the horizontal, to drape it as you have uh, without cracking? Um, the, the paint is incredibly uh, flexible. Um, it's a, of course, it's acrylic paint. If I was using oils, it would be quite different. But yeah. acry acrylic and enamels have a, a very um, strong binding. Mm. And uh, so that creates the flexibility. Yeah, right. Now you say that this, this then this beautiful skin of paint is draped over an armature and that's what we're looking at here. So have you experimented with a range of armatures and this one in particular is, is gives you a lot of pleasure in that it's sitting out from the wall as it is? Yes, and one of the things that um, is important in these works is that, that because they have a number of sides, they've got the front, back, inside, and the actual edge of the work as well. And um, so what I'm trying to do here is give the viewer a glance of what's behind. Mm. Um, so the work isn't just what you see from the front. Mm. Um, the second thing about the armatures is that they play with light and shadow. Mm. And, and you can see in the image how that works. Mm. Um, we can see that even the fold is now part of that shadow, that little vertical fold is just yeah. a wee triangular yeah. point. Mm. 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 And, yeah. and, and the other lovely thing is too that we get color reflection. So as you view the work from the side, which we can't hear, but um, we get this lovely glow from the, from the wall behind. There is a sense of that, Helen. I'm, I'm looking at the bottom shadow. There's kind of two layers of shadow and the top, the top layer where it's closest to the actual paint, you can see a, 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 a tinge of, um, I think of it like a crepuscular glow, you know, this idea about it. It's just this sort of a faint twilight glow somehow. And that's a, that's a beautiful moment, which then does perhaps encourage people to if someone was standing in front of us, they might want to crane their necks around and have a look at the sides and just yes. see what's happening. And it makes it all about the front and the back, as well as the insides and back to front edges and so on. Yes, yes, indeed. Cool. Well, look, what we'll do is we'll pop that image back down. Um, delve into a little bit more about what's behind the, the making of Linefold. Um, I can see that you're delving in a way back through the history of painting, uh, right further back to think about the way the relationship of the painting and the wall, the relationship with the architecture, uh, and you're being um, playfully experimental with that relationship. And in fact, you know, I can think of many wonderful examples throughout contemporary art history anyway, of the way artists have really tested that relationship. So what's important for you um, in terms of driving your practice with this experimentation with the, with the wall? Um, well, uh, I, it, I suppose it started about 20 years ago. Um, uh, during my MFA, I was um, researching the relationship between painting and architecture. And one of the things that became very, um, it was interesting to me anyway, were the number of uh, theorists who also linked textiles to the development of architecture. And I could see a link straight back through this lovely thread, if you like, from painting through architecture to textiles. Um, and, uh, and there are a number of theorists who put forward uh, ideas, but one, resounded with me at the time. It was a, a German architect from the 19th century who wrote about um, the early beginnings of architecture. And his theory is that it began with weaving. Um, as nomads, we traveled and we had to take our shelter with mm. us. And he then went on to say that there are, there are four main um, parts to architecture, the, the hearth, the earthworks, the roof structure and um, so on, and the textile wall. 
And to me, that kind of, um, it, it, it sort of set me on a journey thinking about um, how painting has changed so much to, from being incorporated actually, even into a wall in earlier times to being an object on the wall. Um, so that was one aspect of the practice, of my early practice um, that became, or well, the experimentation was around that. Mm -hmm. And so um, you're taking really this idea um, about the way the, the softness, the interweaving uh, in terms of the textile reference being draped across a rail um, and really um, combining, if you like, or disrupting what we, what we might expect to find. Um, and of course, it's a discussion with regards to painting that's been perhaps going on since about at least the middle of the, the 20th century, where we've really tested, well, what is this thing called painting? Um, and I mean, it's now a kind of a cliche that people have sort of at one stage declared a painting was dead, but I mean, that was, that was a provocative statement that um, doesn't reveal the truth about the fact that painting retains this curiosity and also capacity for experimentation. So what's, what's been your um, driver when you think about a work like Mindful um, to think about the fundamentals of painting? What makes up those fundamentals? Okay. Well, I, I think there, there was the um, other important thread in my practice and that it was, uh, first of all, I, I hadn't painted, I'd stopped painting for a good 10 years pr prior to MFA. I, I was curious about painting, but undecided about how it could continue, for me anyway. Um, mm. During that time, I started uh, researching a, a number of, um, well, researching 20th century, mid-20th mid century abstraction. Mm. And um, the, the subsequent arguments were that painting had no, long, no long validity any longer. And in fact, the minimalists, most of them became known as sculptors and started as painting and work. They um, minimized and, uh, and reduced painting to uh, what they considered were the essentials to the point where they abandoned painting. And I felt that was, there was a, something missing in there. So in further research, I came across the Supports and Services Group. And they're a French group of painters who are working quite differently, had um, what appeared to be reduced painting, but their reduction was more about um, a, a recalibrating of painting, if you like, mm. thinking about the essential elements of canvas and support, stretcher and support. Mm. Um, and so uh, with that in mind, I thought that I could find something within that that would um, help my own practice develop. Mm. And so I'm, the two elements in my work that I'm most concerned with are this, the support and the surface. Mm. Um, and out of that, I've developed a practice that has uh, not just the, the singular surface, it has, a, a, the, as I mentioned earlier, the fronts, the backs, the edges, mm. inside, outside. Mm. Uh, and the and location of the support or the, the nature of the support. What's most important, I think, about your lime fold as an experiment, uh, thinking about support, is that it's away from the wall. It's a different relationship then from the wall. In some respects, it still needs the wall for um, that relationship to happen. Uh, but does, yeah. taking, you, you really, if anything, dissected those two fundamental elements of painting and mm -hmm. really taken them on their own terms, addressed them on their own terms. What yeah. does the support do? What is the role of the surface? Yes, that's right. And, um, and I think too, in doing that, um, for me, what is important is that the paint is still paint. I mean, you can mm. make paintings out of anything, really. Mm. Um, but I've chosen to stay with paint to really emphasize that relationship um, to its history. Mm. Um, uh, so I think when I make paintings, I think of them as being about painting. 
Yes. Uh, yeah. I agree. Yes, that's a, that's a really important thing. I think the idea with abstract painting is that it, an abstract painting is more real to its own truth hmm. than a um, paint used to mimic or represent something else in the world. Uh, yes. It, it's a very truthful object, mindful. Yes. It's celebrating and relishing its own existence. And thank you for sharing all that's the thinking that's gone behind it uh, for this particular series. Thank you, Helen. Okay, thanks, Sue. And thanks everyone for joining Full Focus with Art Collector Magazine today.